Welcome back to our study on the Gospel of Matthew. We are now in Lesson 7, Chapters 11 and 12. I will up front tell you that we will not get all the way through 12 today, uh, we'll, uh, but we'll pick it up next week. Uh, to, next week we're supposed to do Chapter 13, so I'm finishing up 12, and I'll be, uh, of course, doing 13 as well. All right, words of the king. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, that is a key phrase. Remember, uh, in one of our earlier lessons on Matthew, we talked about the five blocks of teaching that Matthew has placed periodically in his gospel. Well, the first block of teaching, remember, was what? The Sermon on the Mount. And after the Sermon on the Mount, it says, after Jesus had taught them, something like that. Well, after each block, he says something like that. And here, it was after the second block. The second block of teaching for Jesus was teaching his disciples in chapter 10. And here in chapter 11, Matthew says, after Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples. So, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. Now, the NIV has towns of Galilee. The complete Jewish Bible says towns nearby. And other versions say their cities. So it was probably Galilee. Uh, so it, uh, it evidently the uh, translators of the NIV uh, <clears throat> just decided to put Galilee in there. Uh, all right, let's look at your first question, if you're doing the questions. Where was John the Baptist when Jesus was teaching and preaching in the towns of Galilee after he had instructed the 12 disciples? Well, verse 2. When John, who was in prison, so he was, John the Baptist was in prison when, uh, all right, I'm starting over again. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. All right, let's take a closer look here. Now, verse 2 talks about John being in prison. Where had John spent the majority of his life? Think about that. In the wilderness, wasn't, wasn't it? He had been in the wide open spaces. The sun was out. It was always bright. And now where is he? He is enclosed in a tiny cell. <coughs> Not only enclosed, but it was dark probably in there. You know, they don't make dungeons bright. So, do you think he could have been a bit discouraged? Also, the entire purpose of his life here on earth was to preach to preach that the kingdom of heaven was at hand, to preach that the Messiah was coming. He was the herald. And now he had been silenced, completely silenced. And he just wanted to know he hadn't heard anything that was going on that he thought should be going on. This Messiah, you know, where... Where is the Messiah that is supposed to come and pronounce judgment? He's supposed to come with his mighty army and help his people, Israel. 
Where, where is that Messiah? Everybody was expecting that. But Jesus was unexpected, even by John. So John sent his disciples to ask Jesus if he was the one who was to come. Now, uh, your question number two, <clears throat> I've already answered, why do you suppose John the Baptist needed confirmation? But, <clears throat> Jesus told his disciples to tell John, he gave him the answer, and he quoted from the following scriptures, and you'll need to write these down. Isaiah 29, verses 18 and 19. And Isaiah chapter 35, verses 4 to 6. These are prophecies of what was to happen when Israel would be restored after the judgment. Okay? I've already read that to you. So Matthew's indicating here that Jesus was a step ahead, was already a step ahead of what the people were expecting. He was showing mercy right now. That mercy was not supposed to come until after the judgment in their minds. This healing, the healing was to come after the sorrow. But Jesus was healing now. So mercy was at the heart of his mission. It always had been. And then in verse 6, he tells John through his disciples, Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Those, he's basically saying, those who are able to see, that have eyes to see, those who are able to recognize the truth, and not be offended by it will know God's blessing. How often do we think, why is this happening to me? I, I don't understand. This is not what I was expecting. We need to pray for eyes to see. That's what Jesus was telling John. Uh, use your eyes to see, your ears to hear. I am the Messiah. I am doing messianic things, just not the things that you're expecting. Moving on. Verse 7. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. John certainly wasn't there. Then, what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you. And more than a prophet. Okay, let's look, look at verse 7 first. This reed swayed by the wind. What, why did Jesus use that analogy? Well, I found out that there was a proverb back in that time talking about a reed blowing in the wind, and it was to describe commonality, something that was common, something that was normal. So Jesus was asking them, did you go out to see something that was normal? You know, would a big crowd of people go out to the wilderness to see something that was common? No, of course not. John was about as uncommon as you could get. He was not common. He was special. Then, in verse 8, he said, well, if you didn't go out to see something common, then you evidently wanted to go see something fantastic and great, someone that was dressed in finery. No, we didn't do that. 
John certainly wasn't dressed in finery. Then what did you go out to see? The people of Israel had not had a prophet in like 400 years. This man, they knew he was special. They went out to him because he was speaking like he had a word from God. He had a message from God, and that is what a prophet is. But a prophet is not just someone who has a message from God. He is also someone who has the courage to deliver it. And this got me thinking, could there have been men in the Old Testament that God gave messages to and told them to go out like Jonah? told them to go out and give this message to certain peoples and they didn't like Jonah he tried to run from God didn't he could there have been and then God taught him a lesson and he went ahead and delivered his message but were there others who were just too afraid to deliver the message that God wanted them to live, to deliver. I don't know. We don't know about that, those people because they, they never came through, okay? Don't know if there were any, not saying that, but there could have been. Um, and Jesus says here that he was a more, more than a prophet. Why? He was more than a prophet because he was also a herald, a herald telling people that the Messiah was coming. All right, um, question number three. Jesus says John the Baptist was greater than anyone ever born, but who did he say is greater than John? Continuing on with verse 10. This is the one about whom it is, it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. This was what made John special. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. He was greater than Abraham. He was greater than Noah. He was greater than Moses. He was greater than David. Among those born of women, no one had been greater than John the Baptist, yet whoever is least in the kingdom is greater than he. That was a bit of a bombshell, wasn't it? Whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So, let's move on to chapter, uh, to, oh, 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 sorry. I want to give you the scripture about uh, what verse 10 is talking about. This is found in Malachi 3, verse 1. I will send you, my mess, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. All right, let's look, <coughs> excuse me, at verse 12. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and violent people have been raiding it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. All right, let's look at that. This is we're, the time span we're talking about is from the is the days of John the Baptist, not before that, but the days of John the Baptist until now. The kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence. Violent people have been raiding it. What is that all about? Okay, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know exactly, but I will tell you what I have discovered. All right, uh, the law and the prophets had only prophesied about John and the Messiah. That's verse 13 had only prophesied about it. All right. Because John the Baptist was the one who was prophesied about, wasn't he? And so was the Messiah, Jesus. Now John then appears preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All 
Jews know these scriptures. They're going to get it. This guy is preaching about the Messiah. Could he be the one that has been prophesied all this time? Is the Messiah about to come? They were enthralled. They were excited by this. And there were a lot of people who were ready and willing and able and excited about being in the army of the Messiah. They wanted to, to be part of that army of this great warrior. And we're talking violence here, okay? You've heard about the zealots. I mean, even one of the 12 disciples was, had been a zealot. But that's not what Jesus was about, was it? Although, the crowd expected it. So it was rather violent. Also, there's another issue here. Think about the leaders of the day, the Jewish leaders of the day. They see this John coming. And they're, they Are they a little nervous about what John is saying? So you're saying that things are going to change? Are we not going to be leaders now? You know, what, what exactly, what, what kind of things exactly are going to happen? So, the coming of John brought excitement, but it also brought some fear. So, let's continue on. Verse 14. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears, let them hear. All right. Uh, this is, um, I'm sorry, I didn't keep up with this, <laughs> but we're moving on to uh, verse 14 and 15. John the Baptist, uh, your question number four, to whom does Jesus compare John the Baptist? He compares it with Elijah who was to come. Now this was in Malachi 4 verse 5 if you want to look that up. And it says, see I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. Which I can see how people might get from that 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 day of judgment was going to come. Elijah He's come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Can you see that? All right. And then 14, Jesus actually spells it out to the people. He specifically tells them here that John the Baptist is the Elijah that was to come, that had been foretold. And he says... Whoever has ears, let them hear. He spells it out that John is the Elijah that was to come, the one that was prophesied. But does he spell out who he was? Does he blatantly tell the crowd, I am the Messiah? No. He's, he's very cryptic here about it. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Why? Well, the time had not come for Jesus yet to say who he is. He had to still be careful because he's, he still had things to do. He had people to talk to, sermons to preach, things to teach the people. And in order to be able to do this unhindered without Herod trying to find him and kill him, you know, Herod had already tried to kill him when he was a baby. What's gonna, what would keep him from trying to kill him now that he's a man? And the Sadducees, the Pharisees, they were already getting very suspicious of this Jesus. So he had to be careful. Uh, and even today, you know, he, was, he wasn't going to force himself on anybody. Does he force himself on us today? No, he does not. Mankind, since the beginning of time, has been given the gift of choice. You can look at the evidence, you can choose Jesus, 
or you can choose not to believe in Jesus. That is your choice. Um, but here with this cryptic statement about the ears, he's trying to get them to think for themselves. He wants us to think for ourselves. If John is the messenger, who am I? Who is this Jesus? Now, um, I want you to turn to Matthew. Can't get mine. Uh, Matthew 4. I'm going to ask you a question. Remember, Jesus started preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. There are only two people that did that. That was John the Baptist and Jesus. But when did Jesus begin preaching that? Well, let's go back to Matthew and see. Matthew 4, verse 12. Let's read that first. And then we're going to go down to 17 and read that. Now, when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. Down to verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So John now, John's preaching was done. Now it's time for Jesus to take over. Okay? Um, it's almost like, it's almost like John was being set aside, isn't it? John had been preaching, he'd been so good, he'd done everything perfectly, and he was ready to help Jesus. He was ready to, to stand by the side of Jesus, by the side of the Messiah, as they took on the rest of the world. But that was not God's plan for John. John had completed his mission on the earth. He had done what he was supposed to do. And now he's in prison. It's almost like, okay, you're done, so I'm going to set you aside now. And that set aside in a good way because you've done what you're supposed to do. How many of us can say we have fulfilled, completely fulfilled our purpose on the earth? That's a great blessing. What else would be set aside? What else was being set aside, even as John was set aside? The law, wasn't it? Was there something wrong with John? No, absolutely not. He did everything he was supposed to do and did it well. What about the law? Was there something wrong with the law? No. No. The law was the word of God. It came from God himself. There couldn't be anything more perfect than the law. But why were they set aside? They were set aside because they told the truth. John and the law, they told the truth. And now the truth was being fulfilled. They had done their job. And done it well. All right, continue. Verse 16. To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you, and you did not dance. Um, I lost my place. Sorry. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For, God, for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking. And they say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. So, what he has done here, uh, he has called this generation, basically, he says they're contrary and they're stubborn. That's what he is inferring. Uh... Contrary and stubborn, sort of like spoiled children. Well, you know, well, let's do this. I don't want to do that. Let, let's go outside. I don't want to do that. If you're outside, let's go inside and play this. No, I don't want to do that. I only want to do what I want to do. Spoiled, contrary. Okay? They didn't, this generation 
didn't want to listen to Jesus. They didn't want to listen to the truth, whether it came from John or from Jesus. They were so sure, so sure that they knew the whole truth, that they had interpreted everything correctly, that they made excuses for not listening. They didn't want to listen. They didn't have to listen. They already knew. Here's the Son of God. And they didn't want to listen to him. Does that happen with us sometimes today? Do we sometimes think we have already learned everything we need to know? We already know the whole truth. We don't need to learn anything else. We're already perfect as we are. We know it all. And we don't want to listen. We don't want to listen when the Spirit tries to tell us something because we have shut it off. Okay, we, we've got to be careful about that. Verse 18, Jesus, I mean not Jesus, John had moved the hearts of the people like no one had before. No one had before. And what did they say? What did the leaders say about John? They said he has a demon. And what about Jesus? Jesus brought ordinary people so very much. He gave them insight into the life that God intended for them to have by giving them the law. He explained things so well. God loves you. He was teaching them about a new goodness, a God that loves them. And he, he was showing them through himself that they had access to God. And what did they say about him? They said he's a glutton and a drunkard. They, they treated him as someone that should have been an outcast. And I want to read you something about that. I want, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 21 and go down to, I believe it's verse 18. They are treating him like a rebellious son, a rebellious son of Israel. Let's read what the law says about a rebellious son of Israel. And also keep in mind that Matthew wrote this gospel to Jews. And Jews knew word for word what was in the law and the prophets. Word for word. They, they could pull out a phrase here and pull out a phrase in uh, pull out a phrase in the law, pull out a phrase in the prophets, and bring them together. Things just clicked when they heard certain phrases. Listen to the phrases in this section. Verse 18. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city at the gate of the place where he lives. And they shall say to the elders of his city, This is our, stub our son. This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. And all Israel shall hear and fear. Now, if you're reading the NIV, I, I didn't realize I had it on the, the ESV. But these, this phrase is still there. Stubborn and rebellious. We have a stubborn and rebellious son. Uh, and go down just at the end of verse 22. He is a glutton and a drunkard. He's a glutton and a drunkard. Go back to verse 19. 
they say, here is a glutton and a drunkard. What are they insinuating in the minds of the people by this phrase, he's a drunkard and a glutton, okay? Or a glutton and a drunkard. And I find it very interesting that if you read on, just right in the next section of, verse, of uh, chapter 21, it says, and if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, this being a rebellious son, was punishable by death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God. That's a prophecy about how Jesus, the Messiah, was to die. Interesting that it's there, specifically. All right. Question number five, why does Jesus denounce the towns where most of his miracles had been performed? This was um, verse 20 through 24. Um, so let's read that. Woe to you, uh, sorry, let's start at 20 because I haven't read that yet. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent, and that's why. They did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago and sat cloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. That's a scary thought. Now, I used to think that, that Jesus was angry when he was saying this, but that is not the case. This word woe means sorrowful pity. Jesus was crushed inside. It crushed him to think that Capernaum, the place that he had lived, he had friends there. He knew people there. They wouldn't listen to him. And he had woe for them, sorrowful pity. Their vision, as we've, as we've been talking about, was a vision of revolution. Violence against violence. Love your neighbor. Hate your enemy. You've heard that before. Their dream was to fight God's battles. But, and that was all well and good. But they wanted to use the weapons of Satan to do it. They just couldn't get that out of their mind. Jesus had offered them a chance to embrace a different vision through the power of his teaching, through the power of his healing. But they didn't want to look at the power. They didn't want to see the power. They didn't want to see the evidence of his spirit. Jesus had brought them the most precious thing in the world, what they've been waiting for, and they ignored it. They turned their backs on it. They refused to even listen. Remember, uh, those of you who were in the class, uh, have heard the class Matthew 8 and 9, that lesson, we, we talked about a lot of miracles, like 10 to 13, something like that. I don't remember exactly how many, but five of those miracles were performed in Capernaum. He had given them every chance to repent. In fact, they were the first ones he went to. And that, that is why they were condemned. Because he went to them first. He expected more from them. The greater the privilege, 
the greater the condemnation if we fail to shoulder the responsibilities that privilege brings. Let me read that again. The greater the privilege, the greater the condemnation if we fail to shoulder the responsibilities that privilege brings. That's almost frightening, isn't it? We are very privileged here, aren't we? Very privileged. So, let's ask God to open our ears so we can hear Him. Open our eyes so we can see His evidence. We need to hear the promptings of His Spirit within us. Your question number six, how does Jesus refer to those who did repent and followed him? Verse 25, at that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. So, he called them little children. Now, there was a long-standing tradition of the Jews. I'll read it just so I get it right. One who devoted himself to learning the law and teasing out its finer points would be ultimately blessed by knowing and understanding God. And so they thought that getting closer to God was to just like stay in the law, tease out every little thing that they could possibly find in there about the law. Jesus, however, he did it. He came to know God by living in his presence, by listening to his voice, by imitating him. He was out with the people. The wise and learned didn't understand God. They didn't understand what God was doing right then because they wouldn't listen. God had sent his son. He was on the earth right then. And they rejected him. They rejected him. They did not listen to him. They, they ignored him, actually, in many, in many cases. Now, let's read on. Uh, yes, Father, verse 26, for this is what you were pleased to do. Show these things, reveal them to little children. Just, it's the simple things, isn't it? Many times we miss the simple things because we think it's supposed to be hard. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And then... He gives the greatest invitation to reveal him. And he says, come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, why did he say that? The Pharisees taught the people that they must carry the yoke of the law. Jesus here offered the yoke of mercy and love. He said he was gentle and humble in heart. Gentle and humble. He's not like a judge or these demanding Pharisees that expected you to keep the letter of the law and, and even more than the law demanded. He wanted to, he wanted to pull back the curtain and, and introduce them to God. He's giving them an invitation. But before he can do this, before he can introduce them to God, they must learn to trust him. And so he talks about this yoke. Question number seven. For what is a yoke used? 
It's, it's, it's used for oxen, it's put on oxen to work together as a team for a, a, for a farmer or, or some kind of work, okay? Uh, so let's, let's look at, at oxen. I've put up here, there's, there's a great uh, story from a vet uh, about oxen. And um, I, I've put that up here uh, for you. I'm not going to go to it right now, but if you want to look at it, it it's, it's very much worth listening to and watching. Uh, but here is what a yoke looks like. Now, this is, you know, the, the ox would, each ox would go here. Um, now, oxen, I don't know how much you know about oxen, but an ox is a bull that's been made into a steer, and then they become oxen if they're going to be used for work. So, this, and in order for them to work well together, they have to be yoked. Now, he says here, my yoke is easy. This easy actually means is well fitted. Each one of these yokes is fitted for a particular ox. Because, you know, like people, all ox are different. All oxen are different, uh, different, you know, some have thick, thin necks, whatever. But so it's fitted to them so that they will work well. Uh, so Jesus says he will, he will give you a well-fitting yoke. So our burdens are going to fit our needs. They're going to fit our abilities. He's not going to. He's not going to give you something that you can't do, that you have, that you don't have the ability to do, because that would be a heavy burden. If you don't have the ability to carry that burden, then it would be too heavy, okay? And but that he never puts a a burden on us that is too heavy. However, neither are our burdens necessarily easy to carry. That's why they're called burdens, okay? But they are laid on us in love. And when, when they're laid on us in love, it makes the, bur love just makes the burden seem lighter, okay? You put burdens on your children to teach them, don't you? But you don't overburden them. And you put those burdens on in love to teach them. All right. Now, how are, the, let, let's look at a couple of oxen here. All right. How do, when, when the, the ox gets that yoke put on him, does he just docilely walk along with the, with the other ox? Is he happy to do that? No. <laughs> Inside, in his heart, he's a bull, and he wants to do what he wants to do. He's a male, so so he, he'll he'll pull on it. He doesn't want to work. He doesn't want the burden. And from what the the YouTube video was talking about, uh, there was the farmer had a uh, a training bull that was older. I mean, he knew the ropes, and he. That's what he did. He trained young, he chained, trained young oxen. And so he would put them on the, the, the yoke, put the yoke on the, the trainer and the, the young ox, and off they would go. And the trainer ox would literally pull <laughs> this training ox with him. And because he was usually bigger. So, and the, the, the uh, young ox would fight it. He didn't want to be there, but day after day, they would train. And eventually, this young ox realizes that, oh, this is so much easier if I just walk along. 
with this other ox that's bigger. You know, so so he starts walking along, realizing, okay, this is not this is not a bad life. I like this. You know, I get I, I get my three meals a day. I get taken care of. I have a nice place to sleep. The you know, as long as I'm not fighting, the burden is not heavy, and it, it's it's actually pretty easy to do this. So that's a good thing. That's a that's a good ox. He can learn. But there are times during this training process where the ox, the, the, uh, the young ox will get sores on him because he's, he's fighting, he's fighting it. And so he gets these huge sores, they're, they're just awful. But he has to continue training even through the sores. And then, and then that's great, and then he finally figures it out. But there are those who don't. They never, they, they will never ever work as a team. They will never be an ox that is fit for work because they have to do their own thing. They will not, they won't work as a team. So what happens to them? Well, what happens to them is what happens to other steers when they become not bulls anymore. They are sent off to the slaughterhouse. And so this farmer, he saves, he is saving these steers to come and work on his farm. But if they will not do it, they have to go to the slaughterhouse. All right, interesting lessons there, isn't it? Uh, all right. Verse, oh, we are in chapter 12, verse 1. And this is all about, heads of the, this first part will be about flecking uh, the heads of grain. I want to tell you just a little bit about chapter 12 before we get into it. There are several crucial events here <clears throat> between Jesus and the Orthodox Jews, the leaders of the day. And Matthew highlights these events because Jesus will use these specific events to make bold statements about himself and his disciples. And this will cause the Jewish leaders to make some decisions about Jesus. It's come to some kind of conclusions. So, let's read chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. Well, he answered, Well, haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or, haven't you read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple desecrate the Sabbath, and yet are innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. All right, your question eight. <clears throat> Excuse me. What was Jesus' response to the Pharisees who questioned him about his disciples plucking and eating heads of grain on the Sabbath? Well, he reminded him, reminded them, didn't he, about this um, this event when David came in uh, to uh, when he ate the consecrated bread. <coughs> all right. First of all, let's talk a little bit about the Sabbath, and I want you to remember. Let's let's just go back to to his invitation. What did we just read here about? what people would give the what he would give people 
I will give you something for your souls. I will, you will find, you will find what? Rest for your souls. Okay? Now, the intended purpose of the Sabbath was rest, wasn't it? Remember, when God instituted the Sabbath, the Israelites had just come from Egypt where they had been slaves for, for 400 years. And they, they weren't used to rest. They needed rest. And God instituted the Sabbath so that they would make sure to rest at least one day that they would allow their families to rest, that they would allow their servants to rest, that they would allow their animals to rest. And he taught them to even allow the land to rest. It was important. So, that, that was the intended purpose of the Sabbath. But the Jewish leaders had turned even the Sabbath into a burden. There were 39 laws about the Sabbath. You know, if, if this happened, then you could do this. But if this happened, then you could do this. But you better be careful if you did this because of the, I mean, it was just so complicated and ridiculous. So they saw the disciples plucking the string. So Basically, they were reaping. Let's, let's go back to our picture. They were reaping the grain when they plucked it. And then you had to, to do like this to separate the chaff from uh, the grain. So that was, that was threshing. And then winnowing was getting the grain out, I think. <laughs> but basically... Before they could eat it, they had to do that, and then they ate it. So you weren't supposed to prepare a meal on the Sabbath, so the leaders were saying, no, they're preparing a meal. So, but really, they were hungry. And Jesus was saying, look, human need takes precedence over the Sabbath. It always has been that way. So he tells them about this, what, what he reminds them about when David came to Abimelech. This was in 1 Samuel 21 verses 1 to 6. Not Abimelech, it was Ahimelech. I gotta get those right. Ahimelech was a priest. David came in and his, he and his men were very hungry. They needed food in order to go on. And at that time, he was the anointed one. He had not become king. He was the anointed one. Saul was still king. So Ahimelech took the old bread of the presence. Um, they, they switched out the bread of the presence every week. And so he gave them the old bread of the presence. It was not lawful for David and his men to eat this. It was only lawful for the priest to do it. That's what the law said. But human need overrode that. And plus, David was the anointed one. Which makes you think also, Jesus was the anointed one at that time, wasn't he? He had not gone on to become king yet. He was the anointed one. Uh, and then he talks about the priests in the temple. So with these, with both of these examples, he follows up and he says, I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. What? He was saying, what is he saying? That he is greater than the temple? That's what's going through their minds. Well, that's a bold statement, isn't it? And then Jesus took something from Hosea 6, verse 6. 
If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not condemned. You would not have condemned the innocent. Actually, if you go back and read Hosea 6, verses 1 through 6, you'll find in verse 2 that that verse references the resurrection. So it, it, it's a messianic passage there. Then he goes on to say the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, uh, the earliest Greek manuscripts actually are written in capital letters. And from what I have found out about this, this phrase, Son of Man, quite often, because the, the Hebrew language did not have many words, uh, they would use son of something to uh, in place of an adjective. That was their adjective. And the adjective they would use or would be for son of man, son of man, that means basically humankind, all right, which is not an adjective, but son of man, they, they commonly used that phrase to talk about mankind in general. So scholars are not absolutely certain whether Jesus is saying son of man, the Messiah is Lord of the Sabbath, or whether he's saying mankind is the Lord of the Sabbath. We just, we just don't know. Uh, but I just thought I'd point that out to you. But either one, really, either one is fine. Uh, but these words, these words here, have caused the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes, to grow suspicious of Jesus. They were already suspicious. They're growing more and more suspicious with every bold statement that he makes. And I'm going to stop here. We'll pick this up uh, next uh, lesson with verse 9, chapter 12. And, uh, and then we'll also uh, have the lesson 13 on the parables. So, I wish you a great day. And thanks for being here. Bye-bye.